Hey guys, it's Chelsea from Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to give you a full and complete tour of all of my gardening spaces here on the ranch. We live in the interior of British Columbia, Canada and are in a zone 3B. What that basically means is that our temperatures get into the negative 30 degrees Celsius in the winter time for extended periods of time. And we also have our um, last frost, frost dates are usually just before the May long weekend. This year we actually had a frost on June 10th, which was a little bit unusual for us. And then we'll also start seeing light frost by the end of August. So we have this really short, intense growing season up here. So what we're gonna do right now is we're just going to start here at my front step. So this is the front step of our house and this area that I'm about to show you here is pretty much the only what I would call a typical flower cottage garden type of garden space that I have um, on my property. This property used to have lots of beautiful gardens when we first moved here but over the years because my attention has been focused on the forest garden and the vegetable garden most of these gardens have been neglected. This is a willow trellis that I put up in the springtime and it has a clematis climbing up it. One of the things about clematis is that they absolutely love to have heat up at the top, but they like their roots to stay cool. So one of the things that you can do is to put a brick like this, or even just some rocks like I have around one of my other clematises to keep the roots nice and cool. This clematis over here just bloomed the other day. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? Sorry guys, the sun is super, super bright right now. Um, my plan for under these windows is I want to put window boxes under here next year because I just think that would look beautiful with flowers cascading down. And we've never been able to figure out why they put the hydrometers here for the power. So what I have done is planted a Drummond's clematis. This is a really fast growing, vigorous clematis that's going to grow up here. And I talked to the power company and they said, as long as they can still read it and the plant doesn't cause any damage to any of this, then it's fine. This little fountain that you can see behind me here, I just put together, I think three days ago now, and I've always wanted to have some kind of running water um, in my front yard, especially up where people walk into my house, because I think it's just such a welcoming sound. So I had this old cast iron tub, and then I just bought a really simple um, solar powered fountain system here and it has a little light so it looks really cute at night. And the thing I love about this location is that my bedroom window is right here. So at nighttime, I can hear the running water from the fountain. And I just absolutely love that. Here I have a wagon that was actually used on this property back in the 1920s and the 1930s. And I have planted wave petunias and geraniums in there. I always plant those in there because it just looks beautiful. By the time mid-August hits, they're all hanging down the side. It's lovely. I realized the other day that I haven't shown you guys my potato patch yet. My main garden, just to give you perspective, we're up at the house over here and then the forest garden is down right here and then the main garden here and the high tunnel in the greenhouse over here. So this beautiful patch here is my potato patch and I have three or four different varieties of potatoes. These ones are more of an early season one and you can see that they're all flowering. And then I have a red storage potato in the middle here, mid season. And then some fingerling potatoes here that are all later season varieties. What we did with this potato patch, which has turned out to have worked extremely well, is we tilled up the grass here, and then we went through and pulled out as much of the grass as we could, and then we dug trenches in it and buried the potatoes down about six inches or so, covered them back up, and then rolled a bale of hay over the top of the entire thing. So it's kind of a mix between a Ruth Stout method, which is growing strictly in mulch like this, in hay or in straw, and a traditional hilling method of potatoes where you put them in the dirt and then you hill them up with dirt as they grow. It took a little bit longer for the potatoes to poke through than usual because of all the mulch on top and that actually protected them from the frost that we ended up having in June. Um, they were all coming up underneath but they hadn't quite poked through the mulch yet by the time the frost came through so it ended up saving them in the end. And I checked under one of these plants the other day and there were tons and tons of potatoes under there. I planted close to 500 pounds of potatoes in this patch, so I'm really hopeful for a bumper crop this year. That would be so awesome. Dan just sent one of the kids down to grab a head of lettuce. He's making burgers for dinner tonight. So we'll start with the lettuces. Okay, which one should we grab here? I think that one because this is the biggest one out of these. Um, one of the things that we do try to do is to leave the plant in the ground. So to leave the roots in the ground because they will start 
sprouting up again like this. And because our summers don't get really, really hot, our lettuce doesn't usually get super bitter. So you can see over here, these ones were cut off and they're sprouting up again. Like two weeks ago, I cut this one off and now like, look at it. I know, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah. What is that? So there you go. That is a beautiful head of lettuce. <laughs> okay. Isn't this the most beautiful lettuce? This is a Salanova. I think this was called an oak leaf, a purple oak leaf lettuce. Isn't that beautiful? And it tastes so good. And another Salanova lettuce. I will put the name um, on the screen here. My brain is just drawing a blanket towards the end of the day. And I cannot remember the name of anything right now. So, um, but this one is lovely. My poor carrot bed. <laughs> Good grief. This is just a never ending battle for me. All of this chickweed that's in here. Um, and it's been so wet that I haven't been able to, you can see how wet the ground is, that I haven't been able to get in here and really do a lot of weeding. But hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to get in here and get this poor little patch cleaned up. My turnip and rutabaga patch is starting to look lovely. You see those rutabagas down there? These are purple globe and they store so well in the root cellar. I'm gonna bring this one in to roast with my burgers that Dan's making tonight. My beet patch is a little bit sad this year, but I should get enough out here to put into the root cellar for winter. And then there are the peas. And the peas have finally started to grow. It has taken these forever, and that is not something I've ever experienced before. And they are flowering like crazy and there are some pods, but I have noticed that some of them are starting to dry out already. So, hey, there's some more. So I'm still holding hope that I will get a fairly decent pea harvest from this. Do you notice anything different about this bean plant compared to this one? Or this one? <laughs> oh, goodness. So back when we got that frost on June 10th, I lost 200 bean plants, all of them just dead. I think that maybe only 10 of them actually made it. So when we replanted all of them, I just decided to replant in hopes that I would get a harvest still. Uh, apparently I planted a whole bunch of pole beans. Uh, there are lots of bush beans here too, but there's definitely a lot of pole beans. So tomorrow when we're gonna come out and spend a whole bunch of time in the garden and get all of this weeding that's accumulated with all this rain that we've had, I'm going to have to get a bunch of sticks and trellises and things for all these pole beans because there's at least, I don't know, probably 15 of them. <laughs> My onions are absolutely killing it. They're looking amazing. And they're starting to bulb up nicely. They look beautiful. And as you can see, I still have not given them a haircut. So again, hopefully tomorrow. I was really excited the other day when I looked in here and I saw some little patty pan squash. That is so exciting. I did plant some lavender in pots. Aren't those beautiful? Um, these will be ones that I'll have to overwinter. I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna have to look into that because I don't think these will make it through the winter up here, but they smell so beautiful. So I wanna find a way. My pickling cucumbers are doing surprisingly well considering how darn cold it has been and how much rain we've had. Generally speaking, these are heat loving plants and I did have them covered as you can see here for the first month that they were out and maybe that was enough of a head start. I have already harvested a couple of good sized pickles off of these. So super excited and hopeful that I'm gonna be making a ton of pickles this year. Good news on the cauliflower front. Look at that gorgeous cauliflower. So all of the ones that were really tiny on my last video are all heading up like this. We harvested four really big ones today. It's just gonna be a bit of a different harvest than last year and more um, staggered. Generally, you've probably noticed this, but I like to garden all at once. So I wanna have all my broccoli coming in at once, harvest it, get it put up, all my cauliflower in at once. And this is just not gonna be that kind of year. And that's okay, because I'm just grateful to get any at all. This row going all the way down there are all parsnips and they are and they are doing really well. I'm super happy with these. Did I mention to you guys the other day that somebody had told me that the cabbage moths prefer green cabbage opposed to purple cabbage? So 
We'll see. I have not seen a huge amount of cabbage worms going on in here or cabbage moss flitting around this year, but um, I'll let you know by the end of the season if that turns out to be true. These are a late season variety. And then these little ones here are all, they're actually ready now. We've started eating these already. Nice tight head. And this is a Copenhagen market cabbage. I absolutely love one of my favorite cabbages for sure. So I'm gonna be starting up with my sauerkraut making probably in the next couple days. We've already started eating um, these cabbages and I plan to make lots of coleslaw with them as well. The purple ones I'll be storing in the root cellar for the winter. Beautiful borage. I have borage all over my garden because it self seeds everywhere. And I just early in the early spring, I'll go pull out all the ones that I don't want and then let the ones that I do want go to flower to feed the bees. My squash, so these are all the squash that were frozen right solid <laughs> back at the beginning of June or mid June. And um, they've started to come back and are starting to get flowers down there. So we will see. I wanted to give you guys a quick update on the abundance kale. I had mentioned I would try to get in touch with the company and see whether um, whether or not they were gonna be producing these seeds again because they didn't this year. And I'm sad to say, and they were sad to inform me that they were getting these seeds from another company who has since decided to stop producing them. And they are a proprietary seed, which from my understanding means they have a patent on these seeds, which is such an extreme bummer. So I'm gonna keep on the hunt for other seeds to try that are similar to these. There's one called Premier. So I'm going to give them a try and try to find something that's as close to this gorgeous kale as possible. And I'll let you guys know about that once I get that all figured out. My tummy's starting to rumble. So I am going to head down to the high tunnel and show you what's happening in there because it's like a jungle in there. It's so beautiful. It's my happy place. I did have an overwatering issue going on. Um, and I was able to figure that out with the help of my mom and with a couple of my friends over on Instagram because I just shared some pictures. I can't show you now because all of the tomatoes are looking pretty good. But I had some kind of veining happening on some of my leaves and almost like a light green veininess. There wasn't any red or purple or anything to it. And I was freaking out because I just thought, oh my gosh, I have 160 tomato plants in here. Please don't let there be a disease come through right now because I'd never seen anything like that. But when someone pointed out potential overwatering, I thought, oh, I'm pretty careful about that. And then I remembered that I had been down here on the phone with my sister when I was watering and I was paying more attention to our phone call than I was to my poor plants <laughs> and I overwatered them. So I've been letting them dry out a little bit and the color is nice and rich on the leaves again. So that's awesome. And then there are the crazy tomatillos that are over six feet tall and are getting completely pollinated by bees. All of the bumblebees, can you see them in there? They are all just coming in through this door and pollinating, there's one, there's so many of them, um, pollinating all of my tomatillos for me, which is awesome. And my beans are going all the way up and they have now touched the roof way up here. So I don't know what they're gonna do now. Maybe go along the side, but down here, they can sneak in without getting stung. This is so cool because I can feel the tomatillo in here. So apparently what I have to do is wait until the husk splits and that's when the tomatillo are, re are ready. And I think I saw one in here that looked like, aha, there it is, that split. So those of you that know tomatillos are probably like, don't pick it, but I'm gonna pick it <laughs> because it's my first ever tomatillo and I wanna open it up. And this is very difficult to do with one hand. Now I realize that I've harvested this probably a little bit too early. I should have waited until the husk was drier and more split than that but I couldn't resist. Look at how cute that is, it's so cute. You're going to be able to witness the first time I've ever tasted a tomatillo. I've never even seen a tomatillo before, so here we go. That's actually really, really good. I can tell that it's not quite ripe, but it's very tart and lemony tasting. Is that how it's supposed to look inside when it's someone's gonna have to tell me who knows tomatillos 
Does it get more like meaty looking? Because the seeds look developed to me. Because there's lots of developed seeds in there. Maybe this is ripe. Tastes good. I'm so excited that I just picked and ate a tomatillo out of my own greenhouse. I did harvest a whole bunch of banana peppers, but those came off of plants that came from the nursery, so I didn't really count it as my own. <laughs> All the rest of these plants I started from seed. Oh, there's the dinner bell. Did you hear it? We have a big old bell that we ring to call anybody in from wherever they are to let them know dinner's ready. All right. <clears throat> I am absolutely famished now, so I'm going to head up to the house and have some burgers with my family. I hope you enjoyed that video, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye!